Hey guys, and welcome to our exam two review for lecture. So in this, I'm gonna go over what are the key highlights of each chapter using our review as kind of like a backbone. There are some things in the review that aren't really relevant to y'all. I didn't edit it as much as I thought I did whenever I gave it to y'all. But I'm gonna go over the key points as well as um, where to find the information in our lecture slides. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're just gonna go in order. So we're gonna start with chapter seven. So chapter seven is specifically asking um, what's the difference between like a phototroph and chemotroph and so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and go to our chapter seven. So with the chemotrophs and everything. So this is the big picture that I want you to get from it. I want you to know what are their energy sources and an example of them. So the big thing, is that phototrophs, what they do is that they capture light energy, they absorb it, and then they use that um, they use that to make molecules that will donate electrons throughout their meta metabolism cycle. Whereas chemotrophs, there are different types. There are four different types. There is organotroph and lithotroph, and e each of those is either aerobic or anaerobic. So with that, with organotrophs that are aerobic, what they do is that they have organic molecules, and those organic molecules include carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So, and then with that, what they do is that they donate their, those electrons directly to oxygen. Whereas with anaerobes, they don't use oxygen at all. And then lithotrophs, they use inorganic molecules, which is anything other than these guys pretty much and then if they're aerobic they use oxygen to donate or they if they're anaerobic then they don't use oxygen so that's a big picture with those guys so an example like if like if i said um an organic anaerobic um organism what he is doing like he does that for metabolism What's an example of, of that process? And the, exa the example would be like fermentation. So that's kind of just the big picture that I want you to get from that. And that's pretty much it for the first part. And then with that, I want you to know the differences between um, delta G. So the big thing with delta G is I want you to know um, what is the difference between exothermic and endothermic reactions. So with that, is this slide. So I'm not going to ask you to calculate delta G on the exam, but I am going to want you to recognize the differences between an exothermic and an endothermic reaction. So an endothermic reaction where that's whenever delta G um, it's going to cause the reaction to become cold and then whereas exothermic is going to release heat. So if it's releasing heat it's going to be negative if it's going to be cold, it's going to be positive. But the big thing is recognize the differences between these graphs. So as you see with an endothermic reaction, delta G is slightly shifted to the left. And then whereas an exothermic is shifted to the right very slightly. So just be able to recognize the differences between them. And then also what is an exothermic and an endothermic reaction. So endothermic reaction has to do with absorbing energy. Exothermic has to do with releasing energy. So that's the big thing, and that's all I wanted you to get from that. And I believe the next thing was enzymes. Oh, yes, the role of enzymes. So the role of enzymes, I want you to know what is their purpose. So the whole purpose of enzymes has to do with they lower the activation energy. That is it. They lower the activation energy, and that's pretty much it. So that's all I want you to know for enzymes. That's really it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Redox reactions. I don't think we really went over that in class. Nah. Okay. So now with that, we go directly into metabolism. So we didn't really go over into redox reactions or anything of that nature. Um, but we did go over catabolism and anabolism. So definitely know the differences between them. So catabolism means that you're breaking things down. 
anabolism, you are building things up. So that's the big thing. And then also, what energy molecules do we use in order to do metabolism? So the two big common energy carriers that every organism will use is ATP, so adenosine, adenosine triphosphate, and then also NADH, okay? So definitely know that as well. That will definitely be a test question. So I think that was the big thing for chapter seven, actually. Um, yeah, that was pretty much the big thing. And then also, I do want you to be able to understand this figure as well as this figure. So be able to tell me what is exactly happening in glycolysis. So in glycolysis, what is happening is that an organism, they have glucose. They're going to break down the glucose and metabolize it. And then from breaking down glucose, you get a yield of NADH and ATP, as well as you you get two pyruvic acids and then I want you to be able to tell me what comes from that pyruvic acid so from that pyruvic acid you're going to make an acetyl-CoA and then in that process of converting pyruvic acid to acetyl-CoA you're making NADH as well as CO2 so definitely be able to tell me what's going on there like I said with these figures um, this is the blown up version of it and it's a little too biochemistry in my opinion for y'all um, so this is exactly what I just said though um, this is just showing you like I said the, the biochem behind it the actual organic chemistry so I'm not too concerned about y'all knowing that but I do want you to know the big picture from you have you have glucose you get pyruvic acid from pyruvic acid you get acetyl-CoA that's the big thing Okay, mm -hmm. and then know the difference of, between the aerobic, anaerobic, and fermentation processes. So those, so aerobic has to do in the presence of oxygen, and anaerobic has to do without the presence of oxygen, and with that, you can get fermentation. And fermentation, this is whenever um, you're forming organic waste, and then you don't use oxygen. So fermentation is an example of an uh, anaerobic anaerobic process. Whereas respiration, that is a form of an aerobic process. So I believe that's the big things guys for chapter seven. I'm just looking over the test to make sure that I am hitting the key points. Also, the electron transport chain, I think, believe that was the last thing. Yes, so uh, the electron transport chain, so I don't know, here we go. So this is of E. coli. So this is the big picture of, of the whole respiration process. So bacteria do not have mitochondria. So since they do not have mitochondria, where are they going to do the electron transport system where they generate most of their ATP. So what's going to happen is that instead of doing it in mitochondria like eukaryotes, they're going to do it within their cellular membrane. So for prokaryotes, they're, they're able to do it, but what happens is that they just need a different place to do it. So the different place that they do it is within the plasma membrane rather than a mitochondrial mem membrane. And then with that you get this generation of protons, of hydrogens. So with that, with the gradient of hydrogens, you're able to um, pump out ATPs from ATP synthase. So that's the big highlights of chapter seven. And then also in terms of E. coli as well. So like I said, for E. coli, what they do is that they use two specific uh, enzymes to do it and that's NADH1 and NDH1 sorry and then SIBO so that is actually what they use during their um, electron transport team process so definitely know that so pretty much everything in terms of metabolism you can refer back always to E. coli and specifically in terms of the electron transport chain which is the last thing 
that happens in metabolism. Okay, so I think that will cover all of chapter seven. If you have any other questions, definitely ask. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and move on to chapter eight. Okay, so chapter eight was all replication, transcription, translation, a very, very heavy, <laughs> a very heavy chapter. But um, like I said, I really want you to know the key points of your enzymes. I want you to know what's the purpose of helicase, not so much primase, but primase, he's a primer. So he's the pre-enzyme of all, and then helicase comes in. And then the purpose of DNA polymerase, DNA ligase, and not so much gyrase. Um, gyrase, I don't believe I even mentioned him in in chapter 13, because he, he was a bullet point in chapter 13. At the very, very end. Yeah, altered gyrase. So I'm not, I'm not concerned about gyrase, but I do want you to definitely know um, helicase, DNA polymerase, DNA ligase, as well as RNA polymerase. Definitely know those. So know the purpose of all of them. What do they all do? Okay. So with that one, I'll probably be matching. Um, and then also, what is the purpose of the sigma factor? And then also the differences between leading and lagging strand. So let me go ahead and just pull up the whole process and we will talk through it. Okay, so this is the whole process of DNA replication at least. And remember, there are three phases of it. There's initiation, elongation, and termination. So you have the initiation, meaning that you're going to open up the DNA, you're going to unzip it, and then what's going to happen is that DNA polymerase is going to come in. He's going to start adding on the leading strand as well as the lagging strand. Um, so remember, the, the leading strand is from 5' prime to 3', prime. lagging strand is 3 to 5', prime. so it's the opposite. And with the lagging strand, you're making something called Owazaki fragments. So Owazaki fragments are just little chunks of, the, of what DNA polymerase adds on. And then DNA ligase, what he comes in is that he comes in and he fixes those little gaps of the Ozaki fragments. He comes in and fixes that, and then once everything that happens, then DNA ligase, he'll finish his job, the DNA will recoil, and we're good to go, and then replication will continue or may not continue depending on, um, depending on if it's necessary, but the likelihood is that it's going to continue on because we're always replicating. So that has to do with DNA. Ooh, oh, sorry guys. Um, and then with RNA, where's that slide? Hmm, I don't have a slide for it. I don't know where the slide is, guys. Okay. Well, anyway, so with RNA, though, whenever you're actually, so once you have your DNA, um, what will happen is that RNA polymerase, he'll just scan the DNA. And then once he scans the DNA, then he'll get that, um, he'll get that start codon. So start codon is AUG. And then what will happen is that the sigma factor, he will pop off. And then once he pops off, then RNA polymerase will create this little bubble and then start making mRNA so we can actually get protein synthesis. So you have DNA to RNA, and then of that RNA, you get an mRNA specifically, and that mRNA will turn into proteins. So with that, 
That brings us to the initiation process. So the initiation process is where you are going to um, start making proteins. So with that, you have, you have to have a ribosome and then the two subunits have to come together. So once that 30S subunit gets that start code on, then the 50S subunit will come in and make the whole ribosomal complex. Then once the whole ribosomal complex starts, then you will have this, this met group, this F met group, that will be your, your first amino acid essentially. And then from there, you'll get elongation. So tRNAs will then come in and add the amino acids. And then with that, you have the, the P site and the A site preoccupied. A peptide bond will form between those two amino acids. And then once that bond is formed, what's gonna happen is that the ribosome is going to shift. So with the ribosome shifting, you're going to pop off then um, you're going to pop off what is not necessary anymore so then the A site can be available again. So once that A site is available again, then tRNA will just keep coming in, they'll be shifting, once there's constant shifting, then and then once that tRNA, we get one of those stop codons, so the UGA, the UAA, the UGA, um, once we get that signal, then elongation will stop and then we'll enter termination. So termination is whenever any of the three codons will come in and then we'll stop and then once that happens the ribosome um, some units will fall off of the mRNA and then we'll just be used again somewhere else. So now we have a protein. Yay proteins! Okay. Um, so be able to transcribe and translate a sequence. So that is what we did actually in class where we did it on the board. So where I'll give you a sequence from the three prime to five prime direction. And then I'll want you to transcribe it or translate it into mRNA. And then from there, I'll want you to translate it into amino acids. So definitely be able to do that guys. That will be a test question. Mm. And then the lac operon. So with the lac operon, oopsies, ah, too many stuff open, um, will be this figure. So I want you to be able to dissect this figure for me. So I want you to be able to tell me that if I were to not give you the glucose and lactose conditions, I would want you to be able to tell me the conditions based on how is that lag gene being expressed. So the first one, like I said, if I were to, let me go ahead and crop this just for, uh, for study purposes. So if that was cropped out, I would want you to be able to tell me what is the glucose and the lactose conditions for this one, as well as the three others, okay? So that's the big thing, so you need to be able to be like, okay, I have a cat protein and an RNA polymerase is present because the repressor protein's not present, then that means that I have low glucose, oops, I have low glucose and I have lactose available. Okay? So be able to dissect each four of these scenarios for the lac operon. Okay. So that's the big picture for chapter eight. Um, there's a review. Okay. Um, for chapter nine, the big thing for chapter nine is be able to tell me the differences between these four uh, processes. So each of these processes we kind of already talked about. So be able to tell me what's the difference between transformation, conjugation, transduction, and transponsins. So with that, um, it'll probably be matching as well. So just be able to tell me what kind of gene transfer is occurring. So with transformation, this is where it is taking up free DNA from its environment. Oh, sorry guys. 
um, free DNA from its environment or from and it can also be either artificial or natural so natural means that it's it's just occurring in nature artificial is where you actually do it in the in the lab now with conjugation so be able to tell me um, this is gene transfer between an F positive to an F negative and then at the end of the entire process you end up with two F positives so the F is like the fertility factor um, I'm not too concerned about if you know like what F factor stands for but I do want you to know what's the purpose of F factor so the purpose of the F factor is what is actually being transferred and it's being transferred from the plasmid DNA, not from the chromosomal DNA. So remember that, guys. So in conjugation, it only has to do with plasmid or extra chromosomal DNA. It does not have to do with the original uh, chromosome, bacterial chromosome, okay? Um, then we have transduction. So transduction, there are two different processes. There's the general and the specialized. So with that, I really just want you to know the big picture of it. So like, what's the big picture of transduction? So this is whenever a phage is carrying a part of the host genome. And then what it does is that it'll transfer it from cell to cell. And that's the big thing that I want you to get from transduction, um, that it involves a, a phage. And then with um, transponsins, this specifically has to do with... Um, with different elements so this is also have to do with um, some viruses but um, the big thing with transponsin is literally this figure where you have a transponsin gene on let's say plasmid and then what's going to happen is that for some reason the the chromosomal and the plasmid DNA got very very close to each other and then that transponsin will literally play hot potato and jump from the plasmid to the to the chromosomal DNA. So I definitely want you to know that where a gene can move from one chromosome thing, one chromosomal DNA to another form of, of DNA. So, or to another chromosome or to another plasmid, as long as it's moving from DNA to DNA to DNA, that is transponsin. Okay? Okie dokie. So, I think that was the big picture for chapter nine. Chapter nine was very, very short, guys. So I think that wraps up chapter nine. Just be able to tell me what are the, the big differences between them. What is each, um, what are each key fi features of each one, such as like um, transformation. Transformation involves like competency factor, um, transformosomes, conjugation, and involves a sex pillars or a mating bridge um transduction that has to do with um, phages so be able to tell me like the main differences between them and then what is the overall process of each okay so with that that brings us to chapter 12. so in chapter 12 we talked about viruses their different structures how is their genome different as well as some um, viral replicate replication processes so with that, let's go ahead and pull up chapter 12. Oops. So chapter 12, like I said, it goes over the viruses. So within viral um, replication, I'm not going to ask you specifically like the whole stepwise process, but I do want you to know the big picture, such as like what part of this, excuse me, what part of the body do they infect primarily? How do they actually enter the body? Like, is it through sexual contact? Is it airborne? Um, or is it just direct contact? It doesn't have to be sexual. Stuff like that. Um, but specifically with viruses, where is it? So the four structures. So be able to tell me the differences between the four structures. So we have the isohedral um, capsid. So an example of that is the herpes simplex. And then we have filamentous, which is the um, um, symmetrical helical structure. And then that's an example of Ebola. Then we have a phage. So a phage has the isohedral head, and then it has this tail with like legs, kind of like spider-like. Um, 
and then also an example of that is just a bacterial phage in general and then we have amorphous so amorphous this is where they have no true shape and then all they have is just an envelope that's that will protect their genome and then this is an example of smallpox so be able to differentiate between the two I'm sorry the two the four um, and then as well as mm, where is it the lytic and lysogenic cycle so be able to tell me what's the differences between them. So lysogenic, this is where they're more virulent. This is whenever they're like actively replicating more so like more aggressively. And then eventually what will happen is that once they're completely done replicating, they will burst through the host cell wall and cell membrane. And they'll just go on spreading their progeny. Whereas lysogenic, this is called temperate and then this is, or tempered, and um, this is whenever the viral genome will integrate into the host genome, and then it'll start replicating from there. Um, eventually, the cell can lice if it does want to enter the, the, um, the lytic cycle, but it doesn't have to. It may just continue on replicating and never enter the lytic cycle, but it definitely can initiate it. Okay, and then what is actually formed, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So what is actually formed whenever the, the viral DNA, which is kind of that purple strand, and then the host strand, which is like the greenish blue color, whenever they integrate, that's called a prophage. And then from there, what can happen is that it'll just start replicating, so it'll undergo normal um, binary fission, and then it'll just be like, like 2, 4, 8, 16, so on and so forth. But then eventually, sometimes what will happen is that it can, um, it can enter the lysogenic cycle. I'm sorry, the, the lytic cycle. But not always. But just know the main differences between them. Okay. Um, viral structures, viruses. Okay, so viral culturing. So why is this so difficult to culture a virus? So it's very difficult to culture a virus because they need a host cell. So you can make them outside of animal tissue or animal models, but it's very, very difficult. You need to give them a host cell for them to replicate it. Because if you don't give them a host cell to replicate in, then they're not going to be able to replicate. And if they can't replicate, then you have no culture, no experiment. So that's not good. But um, you can do it for a little bit, for a little while. So what you'll do is that you'll have, you'll have your virus and then you'll have um, like a bacteria cell present, so like E. coli. E. coli is great for everything. Um, so you'll just put, you'll put um, the phages in presence of bacteria and then they'll come together. And then with that, you can lay them out on a auger plate together, and then eventually the virus can replicate inside of the E. coli and within that broth. So you are allowing the virus to live inside the E. coli, but then since you have an auger plate, you're still allowing the bacteria to also live as well. So you got to make sure that you keep your, your live tissue sample alive as well as your virus. So that's partly why it's very, very difficult because you have... They have, they have to have some kind of host cell. But ideally, you can do it inside an animal model, but that's also very expensive, whereas E. coli is cheap. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So the replication process, like I said, I will not ask you direct questions about how do they replicate, like what is like the 10-step the process of HP, like HPV or anything of that nature. But I do want you to know what do they infect, how do they infect, treatment plans, as well as um, preventative, if there is any. So like with the human papillomavirus, um, you get it through direct sexual contact. So that can be either oral or genitalia, it doesn't matter. Um, if you come in contact with somebody who is, um, 
who is infected with it, there is a potential of you also contracting it. So that's the main way that you can contract it. Also, human papillomavirus is it is um, preventable through vaccines as well as condom use. So that is preventative. And then treatments can be um, antivirals. Um, if somebody does have genital warts, they can be physically removed. That can also aid um, with the, the symptoms of human papilloma. So that's pretty much the big picture of that. We're going to go more into detail about a lot of these viruses whenever we get into true infections. Okay, with the flu virus, I definitely want you to know these enzymes. So we have the NA and the HA, so know what are their purposes, and then as well as, oops, where is it? Right here. So specifically, H, the HA, that will bind directly to the host. So that is how the virus gets in. So that's pretty much the most detail I want you to know about how does the virus gets in. The virus gets in because of the HA, because it binds directly to the host. And then with that, um, how do we treat it? So you can treat the flu with Tamiflu. So Tamiflu, what it does is that it will, um, it will block it. Tamiflu will block the NA, and NA specifically is how it gets out. So HA is entrance, NA is how does it get out. So Tamiflu specifically will block the NA, so it won't allow the virus to leave. And if the virus can't leave, then we have no continual viral progeny and then no, um, no continuous infection of other cells. Okie dokie. So that was that one. And then HIV. So HIV, I want you to know that how does it replicate? So it replicates using a reverse transcriptase. So meaning that instead of going from DNA to RNA, it goes from RNA to DNA. So it goes backwards in a way. <laughs> oh, excuse me. And then also, how does it elude? our immune system so it, it eludes it through two different ways the main way that i want you to know is the first one so definitely know that concept guys and then with dna not dna hiv i think that was it for hiv guys just kidding where is what was the other one Herpes. So it didn't go into herpes actually that much in this in this lecture, I don't think. Oh, right here. So here's the herpes. So herpes, um, know that it is very, very common. Um, what happens with herpes is that it is through um, contact. It doesn't necessarily actually have to be um, like sexual contact. It You could actually get it from sharing a drink with somebody who has like a cold sore. Although that's not as likely, it is technically possible. Um, but it is primarily through sexual contact, such as kissing, oral sex, vaginal, anal sex. That is how you get it. Um, know that there are the three most common types is the varicella zoster, which is the chicken pox and shingles, and then herpes simplex one and two. Those are um, herpes simplex 1 is primarily oral, but it, it can cause um, genital herpes, and then her herpes simplex 2 is genital herpes only. Um, like I said, we'll go more into detail about all these guys later on in the semester in a different chapter. So that's, I believe that's the big picture that I want you to get from chapter 12. Let me just make sure, look over the test real quick. Um, definitely, I want you to know um, what type of virus they are. I forgot to include that, guys. So, know what type of virus it is, such as, like, human papilloma. So, what type of virus is human papilloma? So, human papilloma is a DNA virus. And then, um, influenza. 
Yeah, here, I'll just go to this picture, guys. <laughs> so, human papilloma is a DNA virus, whereas influenza is RNA-based, herpes simplex is DNA-based, and then HIV is RNA-based. So, I'm about the whole single, double-stranded. Don't stress too much about that. Um, but I do want you to know if they start off with a DNA or a an RNA backbone. So, like I said, human papilloma, DNA. Influenza is RNA. Herpes simplex is DNA. And then HIV is RNA-based. Okay, so I believe that will wrap up our chapter 12. Oh, excuse me. So with that, we're going to go to chapter 13. Okay, so chapter 13. So definitely need to know some definitions, guys. So the big definitions and be able to apply the definitions. So like if I were to give you an example, I would want you to be able to tell me based on that example, was it um, sterilization, disinfectant, antiseptic, or um, sanitation. So know the differences between these four guys. And then as well as... Hmm. Yeah, that's the big thing. Yeah, just know the differences between those as well as um, the conditions. So what are the purpose of adding temperature extremes? Um, for temperature extremes, if, if you're adding excessive heat, it's to kill. But if you're adding excessive cold, it's to preserve and to inhibit growth. And then whereas pressure, filtration, and eradication, that is all for to kill. Always to get rid of. Whereas cold is kind of the only one where you want to like preserve. Okie dokie. Mm -hmm. And then... The antibiotics, know the concept of antibiotic selective toxi toxicity. So you want your antibiotics to be selectively toxic because you don't want to hurt your patient. So since you don't want to hurt your patient, you want to make sure that the antibiotics are safe for your patient to take and it's only hurting the pathogen. So with that, you have a broad spectrum and a narrow spectrum. So broad spectrum means that it can span across like killing different types of bacteria. And whereas narrow spectrum, it is going to be specific for that bacteria species only or species type only. Um, know the concept of the susceptibility test. So be able to interpret, um, if I were to give you a picture or something like this in class or on the test, I would want you to be able to interpret it so meaning that whichever one has the biggest zone of inhibition, meaning the biggest area, biggest diameter of no growth, which one is best to give your patient? So in this picture, the best one to give your patient is RA, and the worst one to give your patient is, is OX. So you don't want to give your patient that because that medication did not show to be toxic or inhibit any growth of that microbe. So you want to be giving your patient a uh, pill RA, not OX. So be able to interpret that, as well as be able to tell me the concept of synergism and anagism. So synergism is whenever two drugs, they work very, very well together. They actually boost the effectiveness, whereas antagonist drugs, one will interfere with another drug, making, um, making a drug minimal effective or not, not effective at all. So an example of that one would have been, is, is the following, but also um, antibiotics along with birth control. Okie dokie. So, um, yeah, I think that was really the big things guys
yeah, I think that was it, guys. So, yay. Um, and then with all the medications, I'm not going to expect you to know all the different medication types that we talked about in class. Um, but I will expect you to know, like, what are the reasonings behind why, um, why we have antibiotics, why we have antivirals and antifungals. Um, what are the reasons between why it is more difficult to treat one thing over the other? So, for example, like a reason why I'm treating like fungal, parasitic, and viral, um, why it's more difficult to treat those guys instead of bacteria is because um, with antibiotics, bacteria are very, very different to us as compared to um, fungi because fungi they are they're eukaryotic so they're a little they have harder um, drug targets whereas antibiotics um, they're very very different from us so they're a little bit easier to to create drug targets for um, so that's the big picture of that one And then, ah, antibiotic resistance mechanism. So the main mechanism that we talked about, where is it? Right here. So one of the main mechanisms that, mechanisms that we talked about was the cleaving of penicillin. So definitely know that mechanism. So what actually happens? So what is happening is that, um, that enzyme, the beta-galactamase, is cleaving penicillin, and with cleaving penicillin, penicillin can no longer do its job because it can't bind to anything. So the fact that there's no binding of, of the penicillin, nothing will happen. So the mechanisms, so we did talk about several mechanisms, but the main one is the is the destroying of the antibiotic. But these are the four main ones that we talked about. <sighs> okay, guys. So I think that will wrap up actually our our review session, guys. So I hope this helped y'all. Um, if y'all have any other questions, then just ask me. But um, I'm going to put a little disclaimer out there. This review video is not all in inclusive. So it's more or less just to give you an idea of what I feel that is the big picture of each chapter. But if you still have questions or if there's any clarifications, um, please do not hesitate to email me or ask me in lab on Tuesday, whatever it may be. So. I hope this helped y'all a little bit and then enjoy the rest of your weekend. Don't study too hard, okay guys? And I will see you in class on Tuesday.